Everybody, let's go have a seat. I think we're gonna be ready to start. We don't want to let people waiting too long here, right? Uh, welcome everyone to 2022 Whiskey. Uh, my name is Patricia, and with the help of many of people here, uh, we run, I would say, activities or better pro activities of women in science at Queens. Uh, first, I want to acknowledge that Queens is situated in the traditional national and Hungarian territory. And we are very grateful to be able to uh, uh, live, play, and learn here. Well, it has been almost three years since we have our last uh, in-person discussion like that. I'm very excited. And uh, perhaps many of us here are uh, giving an extra gas or like pushing hard to, to get out of our uh, comfortable zone and uh, come back to the real and not uh, the normal now, right? And uh, then I want you to just give a minute and uh, tap your back and uh, we're here. We, we are here together. And uh, we're here to celebrate diversity because being different, it's so beautiful, right? Being different make our life so much rich. And uh, we learn so much when we, 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 uh, we are open to listen and that we're willing to share our experiences. And this is, is very important. And although we label ourselves women in science at Queens, I want to always remember that um, we are open to all genders because independent of genders, we all, we all have barriers to, to overcome. We all have issues, we all have things to celebrate. And although we are scientists, before we scientists, we are human. So th again, this is open to any professional at any level. And finally, we say that we are in Queens, but we have improved that people outside of Queens University have contributed major for our success. So again, I want to, uh, to say welcome and uh, thank you for joining us. And now I'm gonna uh, call for uh, Dr. Pukau to introduce our very special speaker. Thanks, Patty. So well said. Um, hi, everybody. It's so great to be here, like in person um, with you all. It's been such a long time, and I've really, really missed the in person risk meetings. Um, my name is Caroline Pucall. I'm a professor in psychology. I'm here to introduce our very, very special guest speaker today. Um, so, Dr. Jane Philpott is Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences, Director of the School of Medicine at Queen's, and CEO of the Southeastern Ontario Academic Medical Organization, CMO. She's a medical doctor, a professor of family medicine, and former member of parliament. Prior to politics, Jane spent the first decade of her medical career in Niger, in Niger West Africa. She was a family doctor in Markham uh, Stuffville for 17 years and became Chief of Family Medicine at Markham Stuffville Hospital in 2008. From 2015 to 2019, she served as Federal Minister of Health, Minister of Indigenous Services, President of the Treasury Board, and Minister of Digital Government. Wow. <laughs> um, she currently serves as the Minister's Special Advisor for the Ontario Health Data Platform and was recently elected to the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences. Um, recently, I had the honor and pleasure of serving on a committee um, for a CRC and Global Health uh, with Dr. Philpott, and um, I have learned uh, so much from her infinite wisdom, and I'm very, very excited to hear uh, her lecture today, Daring Leadership for Women in Academia. Welcome, Dr. Philpott. Thanks very much, Caroline. Hello, it's so nice to be here. I'm really happy as well to be able to be gathering in person and to be talking about women in science at Queen's. And uh, thanks, Patty, for reminding us that it's not just about women, and it's not just about science, and it's not just about Queen's. Uh, but uh, hopefully we'll touch on all of those to some uh, measure throughout my time of conversation. I'm gonna try not to talk for too long because I would really like to know what you wanna talk about, what kind of uh, conversation we could have. So uh, if you came expecting a lecture, you're not getting really a formal lecture, you're getting a few of my thoughts on the topic of 
how we can be dairy leaders as women in science and the allies of women in science. Um, uh, but as I say, just keep your minds going on some, some questions that arise from some of the things that I'm going to talk about and uh, I hope we can have some interactive time before you have to all get back to wherever you're off to next. Um, and also by way of preface, I wanted to say that I'm going to start with sort of the evidence-based portion which is a little bit depressing. <laughs> so the first few comments will be on the on a negative, discouraging sign. Then I'm going to move more into experience-based uh, comments, which will be hopefully more encouraging because I think my experience as a woman in science is um, it has been more positive than what the evidence would suggest. And I think we all need to. Uh, as, it, as one says, lean into the positive experiences that many of us have had and figure out how that can be the norm for everyone so that the evidence that shows uh, where things are at will eventually move in the direction that seems a little bit more encouraging. So, so let's start with what the challenges are. I won't dwell on these because I think they're actually fairly well known and uh, as I say, we need to at some point move beyond them, but I think it's important to recognize where we're at. This is really great uh, that all of you are here and, and interested in women in science. And, and particularly, I'm going to talk about the academy writ large. So not just science, not just health sciences, but women in academics. And as you will know, because you look around this place, you'll know that if you look for the faculty across the country in Canada, women actually make up the majority of academic faculty. So that's good news, about 55% of faculty members in, uh, in the country are women. But, and you won't be surprised to know that as you start to look at where those women are in the faculties and what ranks they have, that's where things start to get interesting. And you discover that when you look at assistant professors, it's just less than half. So 49.5% of assistant professors are women. Then you go to associate professors, 43% of associate professors are women. And then what happens when you get to full professors? It's about a quarter. Well, 29%, I could round it down to a quarter. Uh, but you can see, as is probably your experience as well, that while there are lots of women in faculty positions, uh, they don't tend to have those more senior positions. And in fact, uh, the reason that women make up the majority of faculty positions is they tend to be holding uh, the much more junior positions, often non-tenure track, and often instructor's positions. Um, and so, for those of you who are young and thinking about a career in academia, you don't necessarily get to always see those examples of women as full professors and taking leadership roles, um, including roles in decanal positions, for example. But of course, there are all kinds of other stats that one could look at in terms of the challenges that women face in academia. Uh, women are known to publish less than men, and some, um, I, we can talk about all the reasons for that, uh, but statistically, they are published less than men, and so uh, those of you who are experts in these kinds of reasons know what some of the biases are that, that lead to that uh, uh, taking place. If you look at uh, gender gaps in grant funding, it's very clear that they exist. Uh, and it's been argued that women are expected to meet a higher standard in order to achieve equivalent recognition. Um, and this, of course, especially is the case for racialized, uh, including indigenous women. Uh, this has been relatively well studied, and I, I know I'm talking to some people who have made some of this some of their field of work, uh, but just to share for everyone else in the room, uh, a Stanford study talks about the implicit bias against uh, women in academia. Um, and, uh, and has noted that when academic work seems feminine, not just because it's been put forward by women, but when it seems feminine by nature of its topic, that even that alone will, will uh, necessarily uh, cause biases against those studies. And um, even writing about topics associated with women uh, will lead to dissertations um, being uh, considered, well, in a study of a million dissertations, scholars who wrote about topics associated with women were less likely to get uh, promotion and to get senior positions. So lots and lots of evidence of the challenges that women face. Of course, there are also, uh, for those of you who are experiencing it and living it in real life, uh, huge challenges on 
the personal lives of women in academia, um, and I don't need to tell many of you about that, but the reality is that um, hopefully some of you have experienced like me that you have a shared partnership uh, if you happen to have a male partner. Um, but in many cases, the burden, heavily, heavy burden of, of work around the house, domestic activities and childcare, still largely falls uh, on the shoulders of women and leading, of course, to uh, excessive amounts of stress and less support for being able to, to balance um, the challenges of work and family. Um, in the workplace, and I see this happen all the time, the kinds of roles that women are expected to take on are different. Uh, and they often be, they often tend to be the roles that are less uh, beneficial for promotion, uh, that are less likely to produce research, um, and uh, women tend to, to be taking on different kinds of roles in the workplace uh, that have lesser value in terms of academic capital or even social capital. Um, and I won't touch in great detail on matters of harassment and discrimination, but it is well known that women disproportionately report hostility in the workplace, sexual harassment and discrimination, and perceive the academic climate to be un unwelcoming. So um, this uh, is certainly one of the challenges of experiences by women in academia, and we'll get into a little bit around some of the issues related to imposter syndrome, which is a reality for women, but not just women. I don't actually think imposter syndrome is, is as highly gendered as some might, might make out, uh, but certainly other equity deserving groups as well uh, who are underrepresented in, in academia um, have been known to downplay their achievements and therefore less likely to push themselves or put themselves forward for promotions, uh, pay raises, etc. And uh, I think that women have a uh, larger experience in what I call the misfit syndrome. This is my version of the imposter syndrome, um, that women are less likely to feel that they fit in uh, in academic positions because they think differently and they don't necessarily feel safe to be their authentic selves. So that's a little bit of sort of some of just a quick snapshot of some of the challenges that, that women in academia face. And I'm sure most of you could have written that list yourself and could have added to it considerably. But let's focus instead on what we can do about it. Uh, because I, that's what you're here for. You're here because you don't want to accept the way that things are. You want to see a different world for yourselves, uh, for your peers, and for uh, those who will come after us. And so here are a few thoughts and ideas of what I have experienced as I have uh, made my way through an alternate path into academia and other positions of leadership. And so uh, I would first of all say, know for sure what your strengths are. Even if you don't tell them to everybody else, recognize what your strengths are and say them to yourself. Write them down. Write down what you're good at so that you will know as you walk into those meetings, as you walk into those lectures, if you're faced with times where you say, I'm not really sure whether I actually belong here, that you can be able to repeat back to yourself what you know you're good at. Because I know that every one of you in here has extraordinary strengths, some of them that aren't recognized by others and some that are, but you need to know what they are. And then you need to recognize that those strengths may not necessarily be the strengths that are perceived to be important in leadership or in academia, uh, but they may be more important than you realize. We have all sorts of templates and models of who will be successful, and those templates and models about who will be successful are often based on people from a different ethnicity than you, from a different gender than you, uh, from a different background than you, and it's time for us to challenge what kinds of characteristics it takes for someone to be successful. And ultimately, I want you to challenge uh, the, the fact that those of us who feel sometimes like round pegs in square holes actually are exactly the kind of people that the academy needs, exactly the kind of people that society needs. Uh, and so just as you feel sometimes like an imposter in the particular academic situation that you might be in, writ large, many of us do feel inside like we don't belong. And I can tell you that this is a relatively recent revelation of mine that I started to actually realize 
how often throughout my career I have felt like I didn't actually belong, that I was an outsider trying to make my way in an insider's world. But the reality is that it is those round pegs and square holes that move the world forward. Some of you will know the famous Steve Jobs quote where he talks about celebrating the misfits, celebrating the people that don't belong, celebrating the people that believe that they can do something that nobody else has done because that's exactly uh, what it will take to drive society forward. So know those strengths, celebrate the fact that you don't necessarily fit in, but even if you don't fit in, you belong in this place. And that's why I was so excited to see on your poster right side of the room that it said you belong here because you do. Secondly, I would say get ready for unexpected opportunities and make sure your eyes are open for those unexpected opportunities because those are the ones that you need to be ready to jump on. And you need to not disqualify yourself before you even had a chance to give it a go. I would never in a million years have predicted that I would be either the Federal Minister of Health or the Dean of Health Sciences at Queen's. Neither of those were remotely on my radar any time in my previous uh, life before they came onto my radar. Um, but they did come onto my radar as opportunities and I decided to go for it in both cases. Um, and uh, have enormously enjoyed those positions and think that I've done not a bad job at them. So uh, they, th these kinds of things will come along when you're not necessarily expecting them and you need to be ready for them. Some of you I know if we have question time will talk about things like balance and how do you actually make it all work. One of the things I really want to reassure you about what has worked for me and not, will not necessarily be the way to deal with balance for everyone, but to see your life in seasons. So many of you here are much younger than I. I had seasons of my life, well I often say to people, I spent a decade of my life being either pregnant or breastfeeding non-stop. <laughs> so, I have had the great privilege of giving birth five times. Um, one, of my, one of our children died as a, as a toddler, but the other four have survived to adulthood. And if you're going to have five children, you're going to spend a decade being either pregnant or breastfeeding nonstop. And I didn't work full time through most of that decade. And guess what? It didn't hold me back. So it's okay. If that's good for you, if that works for you and your partner, to take a little bit of time to step back, don't panic. You will not derail your career. If that's not what's good right for you, if you love working all the time and you have a three month old at home and your partner or someone else is prepared to do the, the big bulk of the childcare, then go for it. And if people judge you, ignore their judgment, okay? You need to make the decisions that are right for you and your family and your career will figure itself out. Um, so know that life has seasons. Right now, I spend very little time focused on my family because I work nonstop and I'm happy and they're happy and it's right for us now but it wouldn't have been right for me at the time that I had young kids at home. So um, relax and coast with the seasons, knowing that life is long, um, and if, if, you're, if this is not the time for you to be promoted, and this is not the time for you to get you know, uh, uh, all kinds of papers written, um, that that day will eventually come if that's something that's important for you. Um, I found really that what allowed me to be able to move forward was recognizing how much I loved getting things done. So even in those days when I was sitting there uh, breastfeeding nonstop, I was thinking, I was assessing, I was reading, listening, um, thinking about the things that I learned about society, what did and didn't work for the people that I was getting to know, the other parents, the other families in my community. And then when I was ready to get back to work, I said, we gotta fix some stuff around here. I have to get involved. I have to do some advocacy work. I have to get involved in politics because our society doesn't work as well as it can. And as I started to get involved in activities and found that I could actually fix things if I stepped up for leadership roles, it becomes a little bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy that you find that you can put your hand up and say, I can fix that, I can do that, and you find, meet success in those things and then find that those windows of opportunity open up along the way. Um, so I was able to go from uh, living and working 
for a decade on the edge of the desert in West Africa, completely far away from any Canadian academic institution, to come back to the GTA to be able to start teaching medical students, to be able to start getting involved in the Faculty of Medicine at U of T, and just found that the doors opened up more and more as time went along. The third thing I wanted to bring up, so the first was know your strengths, second was be prepared for unexpected opportunities. Number three is spend a lot of time thinking about the other voices that are and faces that are missing, okay? So this is about women, but I'm really super happy to hear Patty talk about the fact that it's not just about women. And when people have asked me over time how much I have felt that my gender impaired my ability to have a career, I've often said that maybe it did a little bit, but I have also watched a whole lot of other people being held back from their careers for issues other than their gender. And that actually mattered more to me because I knew that I could overcome the gender barrier, but I knew that other people around me had barriers that were much more significant, that were harder for them to overcome. Um, you know, I often think about sayings like Walt Disney, who used to, who's quoted as saying, if you can dream it, you can do it. And that's bullshit. <laughs> because there are seven billion people on this planet that have dreams. And not very many of them get to live their dreams out. Not many of them see, get to see their dreams and their ambitions and their ideas and their aspirations come to life. Those of us in this room are enormously privileged. Enormously privileged that we get to sit in this room, that we get to be part of this institution. And there are seven billion other people out there who have just as much brains in their head and have not had the same opportunities that we have had. And so um, much as we need to continue to fight for the rights of women, as we need to continue to fight for women to be able to overcome the kind of barriers that I talked about before, I believe it's even more important than that, that we fight for the rights of those seven billion people who don't get to be in this room for reasons of geography, for reasons of socioeconomic barriers, ethnicity, religion, uh, climate, all kinds of other reasons that hold them back. Um, and yes, we can advance in the direction of our own dreams, but uh, we need to continue to find ways to be able to promote others, women and, other, and, and otherwise, who are not represented in these places, at these tables that we get to be at. Um, people have recently been using the term sponsorship. I don't actually love the term sponsorship. I don't know why it kind of, I, maybe there's like sort of commercial nature to the concept of sponsorship. But, um, but there is tremendous joy in being able to find the people around you who you can see. And if you look, I suspect you are already all doing this. But you will see people around you who are not being, whose names are not being put forward and not being considered. And let me tell you, there's incredible joy in being able to say, I see that person and I'm going to find a way for them to be able to be in a position um, that, to be able to let their dreams live. Um, the fourth area is uh, mentorship that I really want to encourage you on. The incredible value of mentorship, which I think is well known by everybody in this room, um, as a, uh, an important role for us to receive, but also an incredibly important role for us to give. Um, and even the most, the, the youngest, mo earliest on in your career of you in the room can be a mentor to other people. Um, and there's, there's incredible joy in that. I am super thankful for the women who have mentored me, usually informally. Um, often without ever saying, me ever saying, you're my mentor, or them ever saying, I will mentor you. But watching the women around you and listening to the voices of other women is so important. I'll give you just one example of uh, probably the, the woman who I would say was the, the, one of the best mentors to me was a woman named Lynn Wilson, who is now um, Vice Dean International or something at U U University of Toronto Faculty of Medicine. She was my chair of the Department of Family Medicine when I was uh, um, head of the department in my local hospital. And Lynn did all, showed me to, how to do all kinds of things that I still use every day in my work here. Um, but she was the person who said to me when I was an assistant professor, you need to get your application in for associate professor. And I was like naive enough, I'm like, that seems ridiculous. And I went home and told my husband I was going to sign up for this senior promotion work workshop. And he said, why would you do that? I said, I don't really know because I'm not going to get paid anymore and I don't really think it's going to matter and who actually cares. <laughs> but, but it was like, 
<laughs> Sign up. Get this. Get go to the workshop. Get your pro. Get your portfolio together. And finally, I listened to Lynn and put my portfolio together. Did a whole bunch of work. Of course, didn't get paid for any of it, nor nor for the promotion. Um, but you know what happened? Lynn had the foresight to know that someday that would matter to me. So that when I my political career um, kind of went sideways, uh, <laughs> which we can talk about later if you want. Um, and the job of the Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences at Queen's came up. I would never have been able to apply for this role if I hadn't done that this painful work of putting together my application for senior promotion, um, even though it didn't matter to me at the time and I didn't really care what the name was behind your name, behind, behind my name. But those things, as you know, are currency that are important. So listen to the people around you. Go to your back to your offices and look at who's ready for senior promotion that hasn't put their name forward and tell them to get their packages together and help them make it happen. Uh, because we have to make sure that we're doing that. And I think that there are all kinds of other ways that women need to help make sure that one another is promoted, that we nominate one another for awards. Men figured this out a long time ago, how to do this, and we need to start doing it for ourselves. And when I say so women, I, I mean other underrepresented groups as well for promotion, for, uh, for awards, and for all sorts of other opportunities that are there. Um, the fifth thing I wanted to just briefly touch on is systemic change and your role in systemic change. Don't let systemic barriers frustrate you too much because guess what? Systems and policies that get in the way can be changed. I am a fundamental believer in changing broken systems and changing barriers and changing rules. So if the rules aren't working for you, figure out who makes the rules, see if they will change the rules, and if they won't change the rules, then get yourself in their position and change the rules yourself. That's why I went into politics, was I said, the rules are messed up around here and they keep people from being able to be healthy. So who gets to make those rules? Oh, it's people in government? Well, then I'm going to get myself a job in government, and I'm going to change some rules. And that's what I got to do in government, which was a very cool thing to do. But you can do that within your departments, within your uh, centers that you work in, and within your faculties to actually change the rules. And don't believe that the status quo has to remain the status quo. Uh, make sure that you take on, uh, take on opportunities to change the policies. Uh, both the written and the unwritten ones, which um, are part of what gets in the way. Um, the last thing I wanted to talk about was a little bit on characteristics and traits that I think women are particularly good at and that I think you should own and enjoy. One of those is determination. We have survived through our own determination uh, to get things done. Um, and I, you know, men are good at this too, of course, um, but I think that uh, the, the real, one of the real marks of a daring leader is the determination to persevere. And I know that you're all capable of that. And let me just share with you um, a simple example of, of, of uh, what I, how I really enjoy being able to have that spirit and, of determination. It was, and I'm not even watching my clock, so you guys will have to tell me. I'm, I'm already talking longer than I meant to. But anyway, <laughs> um, I, the first cabinet meeting that I was at was on November the 4th, 2015. I don't know if any of you follow politics, but it was the day that Justin Trudeau was sworn in as prime minister. And we all walked across the lawn at Rideau Hall. It was a beautiful day for November. And after that swearing in, we came back to, um, came back to, the cabinet room, first time I went around the cabinet table, it was so exciting. Um, and I, for some reason, was seamless to bring Syrian refugees to Canada. Um, if you remember the 2015 election campaign, one of the, I think, the pivotal promises that, that we made was that we would bring 25,000 Syrian refugees to Canada by the end of the year. And we're sitting around that cabinet table, first time at a cabinet meeting. Um, and the Prime Minister says, we're going to put together an ad hoc committee um, to be able to bring Syrian refugees to Canada. And he names the people that are on the committee, including John McCallum, who is the Minister of Citizenship and Immigration. And then he said, and the chair of the ad hoc committee on Syrian refugees will be Jane Philpott. And I'm like, <laughs> pardon me? I said, first of all, I don't even know what a cabinet committee is. <laughs> uh, I definitely don't know how to chair one. Um, but 
after that first initial shock, I was like, I can do this. I can figure it out, because I've chaired committees before, and this is really important to me. And so I got this incredible opportunity to be able to say, the Prime Minister wants 25,000 Syrian refugees here by the end of the year. Like, we're going to do it. So we turned the machinery of government, we cranked it up, we pulled people together, we worked almost nonstop, um, and basically turned over every possible rock of opportunity. And by December the 10th, five weeks later, the first plane load of Syrian refugees got to Canada, and we hit the 25,000 mark in February. So we were a little bit past our deadline, but that's the kind of determination that I think um, people recognize that there's something about a determined woman that you do not want to get in the way of, and you do not want to say no. So own that, live it, let people know that if they give you a job, you're going to follow through, you're going to be reliable, you're going to not let anybody get in your way until you get the job done. Kind of on the contrary to that one, perhaps, but also beautifully matched with this, is the trait of humility, okay? Um, that I think... Um, Sometimes gets overemphasized in women. We kind of feel like we're supposed to be particularly humble. Um, and uh, sometimes that leads to a false humility, but a genuine, actual understanding of the fact uh, that we are human, that we are fallible, that we are fragile, is actually okay. And what that allows us to do is to listen, which is a great secret recipe for success in leadership. Um, to be able to listen to people well and to take seriously the things that you hear from them. And it's humility that allows us to do that kind of listening. The other thing that humility allows us to do is another secret weapon of leadership, and that is the humility that allows us to take on the small tasks. And I often like to emphasize this to people, is that um, leadership and success, whether it's in academia or anywhere else, is not all a thing of glory. <laughs> There's crappy job, crappy parts of every job, um, and we have to have the humility to recognize that. Um, and some of you have heard me share this quote before, perhaps, because it's one of my very favorite things that Martin Luther King ever wrote about. He said, if it falls to your lot to be a street sweeper, then street, sweep streets like Michelangelo painted paintings, like Beethoven wrote, uh, wrote symphonies, uh, and like Shakespeare wrote poetry. Sweep streets so that all the world will have cause to say, here lived a great street sweeper who swept his job well. So I encourage you in the work that you do to recognize there will be crappy things that you're gonna have to do. Um, but just take joy in doing those things uh, because that's all a part of leadership and people will see it, people will recognize it, and they will in turn do their part, which makes teams work. And the last thing I wanted to just say about characteristics that I think will serve you well, and that is courage. It takes an enormous amount of courage to be able to take your place, uh, the place where you can get shit done. Uh, it takes courage to put your name in for a job that you think you probably won't get, but you sure aren't going to get it if you don't put your name in. And that's how I felt when I put my name in for Dean. I'm like, I'm pretty sure I'm not the kind of person they're looking for, but what the heck? I, I mean, that seems like a cool job. I could get so much done there. I could be able to help train the next generation of health professionals. So, yeah, I'm going to put my name in, and darn if I didn't get the job. So. It, those kinds of things, you really need to take those risks. Be prepared for the fact that there will be lots of failures. There will be lots of disappointments along the way. But have courage. Step forward. Step forward if you believe that taking that step will allow you to make the world healthier, allow you to make the world more just, more beautiful. And if that's the reason that you're doing it, then take the risk see what happens. You may be delightfully surprised with the opportunities that are there. So dream big dreams. Make sure you help the people around you to have their dreams fulfilled as well. Have that dogged determination and uh, take risks and you'll be amazed at what the world will allow you to do. So thank you very much and if we have time left I'll take questions.
you so much, Dean. That was really inspiring. Uh, does anybody have any questions particularly? Can we start with some of the trainees in the room? This is your moment to ask the Dean probably anything. Yes, ma'am. Um, so my question to you is, although, you know, the determination to get things done, how at the same time do you say no? Because I also feel like as women, we're always pressured to take on extra administration tasks. So like, how do you say like, no, it's not fitting a journey we put on together? That is a good question. Um, and it's pretty hard to give kind of a blanket answer to that. Um, a few tips that I have learned along the way are, number one, no is a complete sentence. <laughs> so you don't need to explain you can sometimes just say nope um but i think it's mostly not letting yourself be burdened by the guilt of the fact that you if you have made the choice for the right reasons if it's truly because you feel like your time is better spent doing something else and there might actually be another person for it. Um, then I think sometimes just to be able to say, you know what, this is not the right time for me. I'm so honored that you asked me to do this, but I really believe that it's not in my best interest nor in the best interest of the organization. So putting the organization as part of your reason for me to take on that job at this time. Um, and thank you for your understanding. Leave it at that. Um, so I think, you know, trying to make sure that you're thinking about the people around you and uh, don't don't take on guilt that you don't need to. Do we have any questions in the chat? Um, I've mostly more about the repeat question. Oh, oh, oh yes. Sorry. So I just to check. Can you the chat box? Oh, there we go. That would be really. Well, uh, perfect. We can absolutely repeat the question. Uh, Mia culpa. Uh, yes, ma'am. Hi, um, my name is Moore, and thank you so much for giving us all this. I think we all sometimes need that little like kickstart for you and us in our training. Um, do you, in your in your selection of like what's next for you in every career stage that you move into, do you like comprehensively study the environment itself and and select for an environment that as well will help you prosper? Do you put faith in yourself that you're going to go in in trouble regardless? Because that's kind of important in our in making our career moves. So I just want to know like your your take on that, how you go about those decisions. Mm, okay. Um, so I'm not sure that I'm as methodical as one would like to imagine. Um, I do think it's really a helpful exercise to have a general sense of your life's goal or purpose, to be able to say it in a half a dozen words. And you know, for me, it's like. Actually, I did a podcast for someone a week or so ago, and they actually asked me that. They said, like, tell us about yourself in six words as to, like, what matters to you. And I said, I try to make people healthier. Uh, six words. I did it. Um, but, you know, my, when I sort of stop and think, you know, why did I get put on this planet? What is my, what do I want to be able to say at the end of the day? What would I like to be written on my gravestone kind of thing? Uh, and for me, it's all about trying to make people's lives healthier. And like, if that's the general direction, there are 3000 different avenues that I could choose to get to making people's lives healthier. Um, so some of it is, uh, you know, there's a whole lot of serendipity that happens along the way as to what kind of opportunities might arise and what you know might be the best pathway. Um, as I say, some of that, you know, knowing that that's your general purpose or direction, then when those opportunities come up, like, would you like to apply to be the Dean of Health Sciences? I'm like, me? Um, could that help me make people healthier? Yeah, it could. Do I think I could do the job? Yeah, I could. Um, can I kind of imagine some of the things I could get done there? Yeah. So I, you, you know, you step up and put your, put yourself into that, those opportunities. Um, so I think it's, you know, partly what gives you joy um what what are your natural talents that uh that are are possible sometimes you have to create jobs for yourself but it's basically i have found look around and see what you think you could do to make systems run better um, whether that's in your own office in your own lab in your community um, and as you jump into those opportunities and start to see successes in them doors will open up along the way 
Oh, while we're waiting, Jane. Oh, Patty, no, you, okay. I was gonna say, I was really inspired by embracing the things that make us strong. And I wondered if you wanted to comment a little bit on sometimes how traits that are extremely valued in people who don't identify as women are then relabeled in people who identify as women where leaders become bossy, mm -hmm. for example. And if you have any thoughts on combating that and embracing maybe being more alpha, but not coming across as. <laughs> uh, that's a very good and challenging question. Um, so I do think we need to sort of challenge the narrative about what is, how things are defined differently uh, for, for some, you know, whether it's men and women or other kinds of places that we might be compared to. Um, but I do really think uh, that there is value in recognizing that even though you don't belong in a place that you really have something to offer there and that you're not gonna let those attributes keep you from being able to, to share who you genuinely are. I think a really strong key to leadership is being your absolute authentic self um, unapologetically be who you are. So I don't think you want to change who you are. I think you sometimes need to challenge the responses and even call it out when you see it to say, if a man had said that, how would that have been perceived? That still happens all the time. Um, I definitely saw it around the cabinet table that a woman would say something and then like five minutes later, a man says it and then suddenly it's a great idea. Um, so that happens all the time. And you can actually say, uh, I, that's what I just said five minutes ago. Uh, so so uh, sometimes it's sort of calling it out that will help people to, to, to be able to recognize that. Um, but I think it's a great, I think just owning your, owning the fact that you are different is a, is a really positive thing to be able to say, I think differently than people around this table and that will actually make our work better. And then when, you, when you're the one who's chairing the table for, or whatever role it might be and you hear a voice that doesn't necessarily fit in, recognizing yourself to say what she said is a little bit different but we're not gonna shoot that idea down because it's different that's maybe exactly the idea that we need to consider. So um, that's where the sort of allyship piece, I think, really comes in. Uh, my question is looking, uh, I have two questions. The first one is very looking what Kim's saying about labels or being bossy, if you indeed were just being like determined, right? And it's when it comes for reference letters and many of us here, for the next step in a career, you need a reference letter. And I have colleagues and uh, like I think that, oh, I can't get my reference, I can't get, I think it, the problem is in the reference letter, who is giving my reference letter is instead to say, oh, she's uh, super scientifically, you know, super good in science, but you are, oh, no, she's nice. Mm. So reference letters are not being appropriate greeting for women compared to, to men, and I have come across with situations like that. You obviously have a good mentor, will be a person that puts you forward for associate professor, but sometimes it depends who you ask the reference letter can change the root of your 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 career. Do you have any? Uh, I don't know that I heard necessarily have a great suggestion on that, but you're absolutely right that there's lots of evidence that the way uh, people will describe women, even if it's intended to be positive, will be using different types of character traits. Um, what I would encourage you to do, um, I, and I can tell you as someone who gets asked to write a lot of reference letters, <laughs> um, that offer to, to do a draft for somebody. Um, I, there's nothing wrong with drafting something up and, and maybe get somebody who, you know, think about how, how you would describe one of your male colleagues that you think is really successful and use those exact kinds of terms um, that, that authentically are part of who you are. Um, and so uh, that can sometimes be a helpful way to be able to make sure that you are um, being labeled as not just nice, but incredibly interesting, intelligent and skillful and determined in all these things. Another question, you and Dr. Paul were happy to be in the ATP, important ATP. Do you think that we do a, a good job with CRC2 positions for women? And there is room for improvement uh, like, uh, in universities, not just police? 
Well, as you may be aware, in our last round of CRCs, we had the advantage that we had a federal order requiring us to be able to make sure that this latest round of CRCs was uh, almost entirely women. Um, that was because of a, um, a judicial ruling that that Queen that in writ large in Canada that there were not enough women in research chair positions, and Queen's was amongst the worst of them all. And so we had, I think this last round, we had 10 CRCs and at least nine of them will be women, which is fantastic. Um, but I think it's, you know, when I started off with just talking about how women in general are not promoted into positions. When I became Dean at the Faculty of Health Sciences, I had 17 department heads and guess how many were women? 16. Okay, 16 out of seven. No, sorry, six, I said that wrong. 16 were men. I had one woman, Lynn Foster, that was the only woman department head in my whole faculty. So I'm like, how did that happen in 2020 that we have 16 out of 17 department heads are men? Um, so um, now there are four. So over time, it just takes a while to sort of make sure that women are being equally and fairly considered for these roles, whether it be research chairs or department heads or all sorts of other positions. Yes. Yes, I appreciate that it is, you know, blueprints such as CRC and others promote women and to sort of help bridge that gender gap. But then you have these comments of people say, like, oh, they only got the job because they're a woman and now they're only giving the job to women. So, you know, I know that we have had to have very thick skin, but at some point, like, how do you respond to things like that? Or how do you? Yeah, I think it, it'll probably be a long time before those kinds of accusations are not there about about mer the merit of people's positions. Um, I mean, I think sometimes you can use the evidence to show that uh, uh, that the merit is equal. And I mean, I have we have um, led a, uh, as unbiased as possible of a process for our searches in the in the faculty since I've been uh, dean and I you know I think we've had hired roughly equal numbers of women and men um, and so that will take some time I haven't necessarily said you know gone out and said you have to hire all women um, and then people start to see that you actually are choosing people on the basis of merit so then I think that build some credibility but the reality is so I often think about this in terms of things like our you know, in our um, admissions processes to get into medical school, for example, we have 6,000 applicants for 100 positions. Okay, like that's ridiculous. So 5,500 of those are probably entirely qualified. So once you've sort of said like, the, all these people are qualified, then you can start to say, are there particular groups that have been underrepresented? And amongst those 5,500, would it be reasonable that we particularly identify some underrepresented groups and make sure that they are those that are chosen as opposed to using our routine criteria, which tends to bias towards certain particular groups. So, you know, I think just as much as possible using the evidence. And I do think at some point you do have to also say, you know what, I know in my, you know, in my gut that we led a fair process and this woman got this position because they were the best candidate. Um, so uh, I think in, in the CRC thing, we've got this opportunity where we're able to do some affirmative action, um, which is, uh, as I say, completely defensible, but because it was, a, uh, it was um, um, determined by, by the law that we had to, but yeah, I, after a while, you do just have to be like, let it roll off your skin. If I could be so bold for one moment as one of those equity seeking CRC positions, I am one happy to talk to you anytime about what it's been like, but that hasn't stopped the other grants and papers from rolling in. So yeah. Yeah, if okay. anyone has any questions about whether or not the CRCs who've been appointed were qualified for the job. Yeah. I guess you can look no further than our CVs and our lab websites and the number of students we had cross on the stage last week. So, yay, good point, excellent point. So, did you have your hand up? 
Are you talking to me? Yeah. I actually did. Good. <laughs> um, so earlier you talked about uh, jumping on opportunities or being prepared for um, you know things that uh, arise that you can contribute. So to sort of go in the opposite direction, what if your teacher no? So how do you deal with failure? Oh, that is a good question. Um, I think looking for allies is helpful and don't be afraid to ask allies or, or potential sponsors to kind of speak up for you. Um, there's, you know, um, don't, don't let yourself take shame in that, but you speak to someone and say, hey, could you kind of put in a good word for me? Um, and putting in a good word is exactly what sponsorship is all about. Um, and asking for constructive feedback from people to sort of see what can be, uh, what could be done differently. Um, some of it, I mean, some of it is like, if this path cuts itself off, I'm going to go around by this other path um, to be able to, to make it possible to explore whether there's another way to be able to get at the same purposes. Um, and then people are like, oh, where did she come from? That's amazing what she just did. And so then, you know, you found alternate ways to get recognized. Um, some of it is just um, perseverance and don't let the you know, a lot of no's get you down. I mean, I guess I'm trying to think of, I mean, for me, the biggest no was like getting booted out of my political party um, and, you know, so that I couldn't uh, be part of the, well, anyway, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I stepped down from cabinet and I got booted out of my party, which was a fairly big no, but I'm like, you know what? I want to make the world healthier. I want to bring equity to health systems. So you're not going to let me do that as a minister in cabinet, then I'm going to go out there and find something else. So I think there are often other ways to be able to get at the same thing. And that's why I say just kind of knowing like, what is your general life purpose? What do you want to be able to say when you look back on your life that you actually got done? And there are many, many ways to be able to get to that place. We have a question in the chat. Um, how do you push for systemic change that may not be popular? Uh, um, That's a good one. Yeah, it's, I'd have to, I'd be curious as to what the specific situation is. Um, so there are a few just general tips are um, building the case, building in particular the business case, which it's amazing how often doing the right thing is actually the smarter thing from a sort of business point of view um, and convincing people that, that, that it makes more sense. Um, coming to the table with a solution and a path for how to get there. So, you know, when you're in the position, whether it's a, you know, a dean or whatever other role you might be in or a member of parliament um you know people the number of people who comes to your come to your office and sort of say you know this a b c d e and f are all wrong and it's not working for me and then i'd be like okay so <laughs> where's your solution so if you make sure that when you sense a need for a system systemic barriers come to the table of whoever gets to change those rules with a solution and a path to get to that solution as much as possible that will open the doors for you um, so pointing out problems is really not particularly helpful because probably the person you're pointing out the problems to is generally aware of them not always um, but seeing that you know this is a problem here's why it's not working for us here's why it's not in the institution's best interest to be able to let this problem perpetuate and and here's my solution for how we can fix it. And actually it's gonna cost us less money and give us more outcomes. So really doing your homework to be as prepared as possible, I would say it would be um, how, to, how to hopefully be able to get things done. And as I say, if the system is not changing and the rule makers don't wanna change the rules, then make yourself the rule maker, figure out how you get there yourself in that position. Yes, ma'am. Sorry, just following up on that last comment too. When you were speaking, and first, thank you for a really motivational talk. Um, I did my postdoctoral training in Germany, and in Germany, it's often that people with PhDs run for political office. Um, and in Canada, you know, when, when I saw this on their signs and I asked them the question, they said, Well, who runs for political office in Canada? And I said, I don't know, lawyers, economists, and they said, You know, that makes zero sense because we're, we're putting people up for office that are trained to think critically. So I just want to know if you have a, a comment on why, why scientists in Canada, why academics in Canada don't get involved in politics more to change things. 
But I'm so happy that you brought that up. And let's <laughs> change it, okay? In this room, I want to make sure that several of you consider a career in politics because you're absolutely right. We need more scientists writ large, academics, critical thinkers in government, people that aren't afraid to voice unpopular opinions, that aren't afraid to be able to speak the truth, that will not follow along um, uh, partisan uh, ideological lines that will say, oh no, actually, this is the, this is what the evidence shows. It would enormously transform politics. So um, why is it? I don't know entirely. I think in the, you know, sometimes it's a salary thing. Like you make a decent salary in government, but you don't make great money. And so, you know, for people that are physicians, for example, a lot of them don't want to go into politics because lots of people like to make money. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, so people, you have to be motivated and not worry about sort of what the salary is going to be. Um, I would say comparing academic salaries in jet PhD salaries to, to government salaries are probably not that different. So that may not necessarily, I think it's just a habit, it's culture. So let's change it. I think it's a fantastic idea. So go for it. If we could quickly, we'll end with one more question from the chat on how you manage burnout when pushing yourself to persevere in the face of challenges that get in the way of your goals? Um, two things on that. One is just, you know, I think people generally know what they should be doing in the way of self-care and sort of unashamedly, you know, following through on what you know you need to do. And in the line of just sort of saying no, to sort of say, you know, I need to make sure I get up holiday, these are my limits, this is the amount of sleep I need to get, this is the amount of time I need to have with my family or else I will be dysfunctional around here. So I think there's all that self-care stuff. But the other thing I would say is I think a lot of burnout comes from that sort of sense of helplessness and sense of lack of control of your surroundings. And so um, I think it really depends what the roots of the burnout are. But if the burnout is partly related to the fact that um, I'm kind of banging my head against the wall and this is, this is, these systems are not working for me. Um, I have found that it's highly preventative of burnout um, to be able to go out there and find small things that can be fixed in the circumstances around you. Um, and that is so protective of being able to, and because it just, it makes you happy. Uh, and so it's not always the amount of work that we do, it's the fact that we're doing work that we don't see results. Um, and so I think um, just finding ways to be able to, um, to do something that will make the circumstances better, not just for yourself, but for everybody around you will be, um, will really build your resilience and protect you from burnout. Well, with that, does everyone wanna join me in thanking Dr. Philpott? Thank you.